Hello everyone, and welcome again in the world of forgotten motorcycle relics. Subject of today's review is infamous Honda VF1000F Interceptor. As most of you folks probably know, early 80s was a time when bike's performance war was at its full swing. Big Japanese 4 had some serious contenders released to the arena. Suzuki's Katana 1100 set the tone in 1982. Kawasaki also pushed hard with its fuel-injected big-bore GPZ 1100 Unitrack, and Cutting Edge liquid-cooled GPZ 900R released a bit later. All of the above were very powerful and interesting machines, but Honda's recipe for grabbing attention in that segment was drastically different. Aforementioned difference lied in the technology used to build their new creation. All leading models sold by Honda's competition were based on tried and tested inline four cylinder layout. That way of cylinder placement has of course got many benefits, with simplicity of maintenance being most apparent. One long cylinder head means one timing chain, one tensioner and two camshafts. Arranging cylinders in V layout doubles everything, making servicing of the engine more complex. On the flip side, V4 motor built by Honda offered other remarkable benefits. 90 degree angle between the cylinders provides good primary balance and eliminates most of vibrations. Thanks to two cylinder banks instead of one long row known from inline 4, Honda's motor is also exceptionally narrow. It's quite unbelievable how slim this engine actually is. The width of the bike is not much greater than what you would see in Suzuki GS500. And remember, we're talking about a thousand cc superbike. The biggest advantage of this design is the torque curve it provides. V4 torque is available from as low as idle RPM and keeps its linear climb till redline. Power everywhere was the slogan Honda's engineers believed when delivering this package. Right, VF1000F interceptor on the open road. So what I'm going to start from is the um, riding position. To put it simply, it's a strange riding position because it's somewhat comfortable. Actually, in fact, it's very comfortable, but bizarre. I'm just not used to it. Um, I've been riding many bikes recently, very different types of bikes, but uh, this is um, unique. Um, so basically the seat is very comfortable, very soft plush. Then uh, the placement of feet on the pegs is again quite comfy. Your knees aren't really that bent. Uh, and also uh, pegs are covered with rubber, uh, which eliminates um, the vibration. And then we've got the handlebars, uh, which they are comfortable because they're high, so there's not much pressure on your uh, wrists, so you won't experience much pain there. However, um, the bars are somewhat far, so you need to reach, reach far to get them. Uh, so I guess it's not really a big deal, but um, you just need to get used to it. Another very interesting feature of this motorcycle is that the bars are actually adjustable. So you can adjust them here to be slightly more away from you or closer to you. So broadly speaking, riding position is uh, fairly comfortable and I wouldn't have a problem commuting on, on this motorcycle to work or taking it for longer trips. When it comes to gauges, we've got speedometer, which reads to 160 miles per hour. It also shows kilometers per hour. We've also got the rev counter, which goes up to 11,000 RPM. Uh, red line starts at 10,500. And nicely set up idle on this engine is about 11,1200 RPM. We've also got the temperature gauge, fuel gauge, uh, total mileage, uh, trip mileage, and some dash lights. Uh, two indicator lights, left and right, high beam, neutral light, oil light, and um, there's also a tail little dash light which um, reminds you to switch your lights on. If you don't have your lights on, it will be lit red. In terms of handling, this is a typical early 80s motorcycle. The tires are narrow, the forks are skinny, and the rear shock, although it offers some adjustability and actually comes from Showa, uh, isn't very sophisticated. So uh, the bike handles the way it handles, you know, it's, it, there's no drama, but don't expect blazing handling from it. 
it weighs over 250 kilos ready to go therefore all of those features together make it be a rather average handling package when it comes to mirrors they're actually not that bad I can actually see what's behind me so definitely a plus for that this small little fairing or windscreen does its job pretty well considering the riding position is fairly upright resembling something that uh, uh, you would get in a Bundy 1200 or I don't know maybe ZRX 1200 the little fairing works pretty well this is about 75 miles per hour and in terms of wind deflection it's a pass again no complaints about that so clutch hydraulically uh, actuated it's somewhat heavy in operation but no big deal nothing really dramatic again something you just get used to whoa that's nice it, you know this v4 really pulls hard brakes again i'm gonna i'm gonna recall the 80s 80s technology because they are they are what they are they're not bad as such but both front and rear brake have a distinct delay you press on the lever there's like a split of second delay and then you get the slowing down the great feature of this bike is the fuel tank it's got a massive 23 liter fuel tank which means if you take it steady and stick to the national speed limits you might actually achieve something like i don't know 240 miles of range if you take it steady the fuel tap is actually positioned on the tank so and also the knob is quite honestly massive there's no way you'll have trouble uh, switching from on to reserve um, when it comes to that moment there's a lot of motorcycles out there where fuel tap is positioned somewhere on the frame or below the tank and it's so tiny that you really struggle to um, change its position during the ride the main interceptor speaks for itself superbikes will always get their heart pumping no matter they're new or old and there's certainly no disappointment here VF's 998cc dual overhead cam 16 valve V4 engine is derived from iconic Honda V65 Magna and that guarantees great acceleration. Fed by 36mm carbs motor pulls well in entire rev range and isn't afraid to rev. In its peak it delivers 114 horsepower which is accompanied by a characteristic V4 screen. Although the motor feels fine in most of the revs, I found it likes to live in mid-range where it offers flexible torque. I never tested top speed of the interceptor but I can tell you one thing, 150 miles per hour seems very plausible. So to sum up, if power and torque are to be concerned, V1000 does the job pretty well in fact. Sadly, there is more than that to approve an engine. Early V4s built by Honda for Interceptors, Magnus and Sabres are no doubt powerful and interesting power plants, but they never really took off due to infamous chocolate camshaft fiasco. 
Long story short, many of the VF models suffered from pitting on cam lobes and their followers, in some cases at very surprisingly low mileage. Initially Honda tried to address that by redesigned cams made using improved manufacturing process, but the problem never really fully disappeared. Some race accessory companies offered special kits designed for V4 engine family, which improved oil flow for the cylinder head. The idea was to provide more oil at higher pressure to cam lobes and followers to improve lubrication. Oil mod kits are still available for sale, I actually saw one on eBay fairly recently, and I reckon they would be a benefit here. If wear of cam lobes is affecting the engine's running, then repairs can be made. This is usually done by re-welding of the cam lobes and the followers. Aftermarket camshafts made to order is another option. Best recipe for long life of your old V4 though is maintenance. So maintain it well with quality oil change regularly, keeping valve clearance in check and avoid prolonged idling. Put it simply, you look after your V4, it will run well. The 1000 Interceptor is a quirky motorcycle for many reasons. Against the trend of its time, it sports a V4 motor which is cooled by liquid, not by air. Frame is not only used to cradle the engine, but also to be a passage for coolant which circulates through it. To provide that cooling, V1000 has two radiators, where one of them is tucked away behind the front fairing cowl. Front suspension got equipped with track anti-dive system, which can be adjusted for its reaction. Effectiveness of the system is rather questionable, of course, but it's there. Forks are also air-assisted, with automotive valve used for inflation to correct spec of pressure. In some areas, V1000 reminds more of a touring or all-rounder type of bike. It has a center stand, side-mounted passenger grips, massive 23-liter fuel tank and fairly comfortable riding position. All of the aforementioned features make for somewhat of a strange end product. Let's sum it up. Is V1000 Interceptor worth your interest? Yes, it is on one stipulation, and that is buying a clean and looked after example from somebody who understands the demands that V4s put on their owners. Tutty bikes will give you nothing but pain, so stay away from those. The strongest trait of Interceptors is their great Mad Max type of styling and very peppy engine. Prices are also fairly attractive considering how rarely those motors come up for sale these days. I got myself one some time ago and I'm pretty happy so far. I hope the same will happen to you if you decide to go for one. All the best folks and till next time.